Good afternoon, students, and welcome to today's mini lecture on the mind and methods of the artist. I, of course, am your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to take a deep dive into what it means to approach the ancient world through the disciplinary lens of the arts. So set up that easel, start chiseling those sculptures, and fire up the kilns. And in doing so, appreciate all the beauty humanity has created as you journey with me to investigate the arts. So what exactly is an art artistic perspective, you might ask? Well, you might think of it as exactly what it sounds like. Artists produce and create art, which then can be interpreted in lieu of their culture, their context, and their intentions. So part of taking an artistic perspective on the world means understanding the creative and aesthetic values for cultures around the world, from the ancient past to the present day. But an artistic perspective goes far beyond just thinking about aesthetics. That is, it goes beyond what people consider to be pretty or good looking. Indeed, taking an artistic perspective involves understanding the meaning and messages behind an artist's given work. To embrace the artistic perspective, we have to ask why a creation was made, what it's trying to convey, who it was meant for, and how it goes about accomplishing its goal. In many ways, it's kind of sort of like interpreting a complex written text or a spoken message. You have to think about the artist, the audience, and the context to really understand what's going on. Now, when it comes to history, a scholar employing the artistic perspective might be interested in understanding the sculptures, ceramics, paintings, and architecture of ancient cultures. Rather than focusing on texts, however, as is so often the case when employing a humanistic lens, artists tend to focus on the aesthetics and iconography of the material record. They're interested in how and why those cultures produced a given work of art, as well as how the work might be interpreted and received in those cultures. So, in ancient Egypt, for example, someone employing the artistic perspective would be fascinated by how ancient tomb and temple reliefs were created, and they'd be in luck. We actually have partially finished sculptures which show how Egyptian artists created such reproducible depictions in their works. Now, other artistic scholars might be particularly interested in the preparation of the human body after death. Not only does the mummification process help preserve the body for centuries to come, the body is often decorated with masks and jewelry and texts, all of which help the deceased successfully navigate the treacherous journey through the Egyptian afterlife. Now, much like the Egyptians, the ancient Greeks are known uh, just as much for their artistic depictions, uh, you know, vase paintings, sculptures, ceramics, as they are for things like democracy and theater and philosophy. An artistic scholar interested in the ancient Greek world might be interested in, for example, uh, in understanding how the painting, gloss, and glaze process for the famous Athenian black figure vases of the 6th century BC was actually created. And if some of the artists are interested in the technique itself, other artistic scholars might be interested in how the iconography is chosen, whether it's a myth mythological scene or a floral or faunal decoration. And whether that decision is based on the context it's meant for, right? Does it differ based on a tomb versus a house or a temple versus a shop? Similarly, ancient Rome is known for its incredibly realistic sculpture, making it seem as though the stone is actually coming to life. In fact, late Republican sculpture is so realistic, it's called verism, after the Latin term for realistic. Scholars employing the artistic perspective might investigate why wealthy Romans moved away from an idealistic form of sculpture where old weathered people actually presented themselves as young and flawless towards a new style that shows every wrinkle, every bald spot, and every double chin. Let's take a look at how one might employ the artistic perspective by looking at the royal sculptures of ancient Egypt. Sure, they look awesome. But the artists who created these also imbued them with specific meanings for particular audiences. The Middle Kingdom is especially noteworthy. Throughout the preceding millennium, Egyptian pharaohs portrayed themselves like gods, young, idealized, strong, happy, full of life. From an artistic perspective, this of course makes sense. Most people aren't ever going to actually see the real pharaoh, 
and so their artistic depictions might determine how they're perceived by the people they rule. And if that's the case, it's incredibly understandable that Old Kingdom pharaohs wanted the populace to perceive them as youthful and strong. In the Middle Kingdom, however, this entire aesthetic changes. Now, instead of the eternally youthful pharaoh, Egyptian kings present themselves as the shepherd of the people, sometimes literally holding a shepherd's crook as a sign of their care for their citizens. Other Middle Kingdom sculptures diverge from the youthful look, intentionally highlighting the lines of age on the face of the pharaoh, showing the hard work it takes to rule, and presenting the pharaoh with exaggerated ears, implying that he listens to what his people have to say. So next time someone says Egyptian sculpture doesn't change, just ask them to compare the statue of Khafre with the statue of Amenemhat III, and see what they have to say about that. <laughs> Let's journey to the world of ancient Rome to take a look at another example of, of this in practice. So here we're looking at a 2000 year old Roman statue known as the Prima Porta Augustus. Fun fact here, it gets its name because it's a statue of Rome's first emperor, Augustus, and it was found at the Prima Porta, that is one of Rome's main city gates. Now an artist could tell you that superficially, we're looking at a statue of the emperor as a young man and a closer investigation could tell you even more. The artist might argue that he's intentionally portraying himself as youthful, even if he was much older when it was created, because that conveys a sense of physical strength, power, and invincibility. But the artist would also look at more nuanced messages hidden within the iconography. So here on his leg, we can see a little tiny baby riding a dolphin. And this isn't just for looks. It's tiny baby Cupid, of course, who's the son of Venus, who turns out to be the mother of Aeneas after she slept with his dad in Chises. So what looks to be a cute baby boy is actually an important message about Augustus's divine lineage. And if we look closer here on the breastplate, we can see Augustus himself receiving the previously stolen standards of Rome back from the Parthians. So the Prima Porta statue of Augustus Right, is wearing armor featuring himself showing how he's symbolically restoring Rome by receiving the eagle standard. So artists help us better situate ourselves within the broader context of humanity as a whole. They teach us about the diverse ways that material culture can be used to express one's inner feelings, dem demonstrate cultural values, and comment on the state of society more broadly. In doing so, this perspective helps us connect emotionally to the world around us and learn how to express our inner feelings. We get to see uh, things from others' perspectives and reflect on what that means for us individually. In short, artists explore, observe, reflect, practice, produce, and communicate. So don't think that being an artist means cutting off your ear and putting some swirls on a canvas. It's for everyone who wants to express their own feelings and their place in the larger world. So go forth, grab your tools, and create a masterpiece of your own in this class.